Okay, let's get right into this. This rule potentially has the largest capacity for changing how social security, disability insurance, and supplemental security income are adjudicated going forward. It is something that is likely to help claimants. Now, it's more complicated than a broad brush, but let me go through it with you real quick. It's directly from the Federal Register. So for all the people who comment that there's no rule change, there's nothing coming, please turn that dial in your brain just slightly past barely waking up to here it is. It's directly from the Federal Register because I get a lot of comments in the comment section where it's just people are just, I, they're oblivious. They're oblivious. They're like, there's no, there's no rule. This is the rule. Okay. Effective date. It will come into effect on 6-8-24. Document citation, 89 FR 27653, pages 27653 27668, 20 CFR 404 and 20 CFR 416. For citation purposes, docket numbers, SSA for 2023 to 2024, let's get into it. Intermediate improvement to the disability adjudication process, including how we consider past work. Now, we can't cover the whole thing in this video, but we're going to cover the most important change that they're going to be doing and how it specifically affects your ability to win social security benefits going forward, or frankly, just keeping them. You know, a lot of people are going through an audit with the SSA right now. I now have the numbers back uh, specifically from the ALJ uh, details from OIG, the Office of Inspector General. We are going through a purge, a purge of disabled people off of the program. That's what's happening right now. Let's get into it real quick. I'm going to go ahead and walk you through it. I'm going to skip right through most of this stuff to the proposed rule because that's what's important here. Proposed rule. On September 29th, 2023, we published a notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register entitled Intermediate Improvement to the Disability Adjudication Process. In the NPRM, right, that's the notice of proposed rulemaking, we propose to revise our regulation definition of PRW, that's past relevant work, and to make another minor revision to our regulatory text about the vocational factor of work experience. Specifically, we proposed to define past relevant work as work, okay, an individual has done within the past five years, not 15, that's what the current rule is, not 15, the past five years, which was performed at SGA level, and that lasted long enough for the individual to learn how to do it. Additionally, we're proposed to revise the relevant work period for CDRs to include work an individual has done within the past five years to the date of the CDR determination or decision. Okay, so let's go through this real quick. Let's, uh, let's talk about how uh, this is going to affect people. There's a little bit more uh, I'll, I'll add it. I'll add a little bit more. Also, B, thank you for the dollar ninety nine donation. That's awesome. Very, very cool. So let's go through this real quick. Okay. We also propose to remove a sentence in 20 CFR 44.1565 subsection A that explained that the intent of our work experience rules is to ensure that remote work experience is not currently applied. The NPRM includes a full discussion of how the proposal would affect steps four and five of the sequential evaluation process rationale for the proposed revisions and an analysis of its effects. In this final rule, we are adopting the NPRM's proposed revisions, discussions, rationale analysis in full with the modif modifications described below. All right, so before we go through the modifications of what the new rule is going to be when it comes out, and specifically it's going to come out on 6824, okay? So I'm giving you, the, you know, fresh off the press. You know, if you guys are wondering how fresh off the press this thing is, this is a rule from 41824 days ago, days ago. And remember, I called this rule not too long ago. I literally got a call from somebody that said, hey, go check the Federal Register. You called it, and there it was. Let's go through this real quick. All right. What's happening is in the five-step sequential process when you are being adjudicated to be found disabled, Element four of the five elements and element five of the five elements are the work history slash work ability elements. Element four is can you do your past work within the past 15 years? Well, as of 6 8 24, it will no longer be that. It will be can you do the work you once did within the past five years? A lot of the logical reasoning behind this is that 
essentially, to put it simply, people don't remember what the hell they did 15 years ago. They just don't. It's just, it's out there. Like, right? We don't remember the skills we have with that job. We don't remember how to do that job. It's unreasonable to attach to something that far back. So if you reduce the 15 years to five years, what happens is a lot more people are going to get passed through from basically element four, can they do their past relevant work, where they just won't have a lot of jobs within the past five years, into element five. So fewer denials will occur at the element four stage. Now, will this increase the denials at the element five stage? No, it should have no effect on the amount of denials at the element five stage. It should actually potentially increase the approvals because there's not as many options of types of you know skilled jobs, semi-skilled jobs, et cetera. So when we look at transferable skills and things like that, and do they have the capacity to do direct entry back into the work environment, we expect there to be less skills available in consideration because there's fewer jobs, which is good for the claimant because it will increase the likelihood that people will be found disabled. This rule is probably in 2023, 2022, 2024, the biggest successful win for disability claimants applying for disability benefits. And also, to be fair, it's also the biggest win for disability claimants who are currently on disability benefits. However, it is going to mostly help those who are farther forward in life, your 50, 55ers, 60-year-olds, etc. I can foresee this likely helping those individuals even more going forward, okay? Now, let's go through the modifications, and then we'll talk about this other rule, the whole removal of the sentence, to explain that the intent of our work experience rules is to ensure that remote work experience is not currently applied, okay? And the whole idea, and I'll, I'll read you through this, we also propose to remove a sentence, and they want to get rid of that sentence because they will then counterbalance the good news of 15 years down to five years with shitty news that if they go ahead and start considering at-home work, it's going to make it significantly harder for people to be found disabled. Here's why. There are very few people nowadays who are on disability benefits, unless they were found disabled way back, that will literally say, well... I'm disabled, but I can still go fishing. Well, I'm disabled, but I can still get on my Harley and ride to North Dakota. That is a very, very limited dying breed of disabled individual that literally was found disabled back in the day. You no longer have those individuals because the severity levels for disability benefits have increased. It's become much more difficult to be found disabled. And the culture has changed with disability benefits. You know, remember those people that used to scream about how they knew everything and how brilliant they were and all that jazz? Or the people that were like, I still have to be able to be a human. I still have to have fun when I'm on disability benefits. Or I still have to be able to take care of my husband the way he likes. Or take care of my wife the way she likes. Those people, they don't exist anymore, not in the new breed that are found disabled because they fall outside of the severity level because they're just not severe enough that they were found disabled during a time when you could be like that. Now, as a result of that, when you start looking at putting in the potential of looking at jobs, okay, that are at home work, sitting at a computer work, right? And all you have to do is do one hour a little bit more earnings above the capacity of part-time work so that you're doing just enough full-time work, they're going to get many, many people. And I'm going to say this, this is moving in the direction as a result of things like that, where you will not see people that are younger getting on disability benefits that are in the severe-ish category. It's almost going to have to be severe to extreme category for those people under 50. And that change in the future of disability benefits is going to be largely due to the fact that the government has studied heavily how much they have to pay out in benefits to individuals who, to be fair, are younger when found disabled. So what I've noticed from percentages of representing individuals that kid claims are less likely to go through, okay? We're talking zero to 18, right? And then basically 18 to 50 are very, very unlikely to go through. So we as a law firm have, for the most part, almost cut off any claimants that are basically under 50 years old. Because even if we've got a really good claim, we're still getting bad decisions from judges because at the end of the day, they control the output of who gets approved. That's it. They're in charge of it. All right. 
Let's look at the modifications from NPRM. We are adopting our original proposal with some modifications. The regulatory text in this final rule differs slightly from the regulatory text we propose in the NPRM due to, here's the reasoning. One, an inadvertent error, right, that was a little thing, and two, public feedback submitted in response to our questions in the NPRM. We detail these changes below. Okay, in the NPRM, we propose to remove a sentence in 20 CFR 44.1565 subsection A. That explains that the intent of our work experience rules is to ensure that remote work experience is not currently applied. However, the sentence inadvertently remained within the proposed regulation text. Now, here's the thing. This is all part of some future where this whole thing is going. Okay, so in the future, they're going to include that. And, and you might be sitting there saying, no, 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 they want to keep it out. That's their intent. Bullshit. Total and complete bullshit, and I'll tell you why. They have abandoned their multi, 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 multi million dollar program where they tried to create a new dictionary of occupational titles. They just abandoned it. We just heard that from the commissioner. He said, look, we're spending wildly on this. We don't have a direction for it. We are abandoning it. We are just going to be using the dictionary of occupational titles. Now, what happens if you modify the Dictionary of Occupational Titles to a modern system that includes at-home, sitting-on-your-butt jobs? Well, all of a sudden, there's a lot of jobs that potentially disabled people could do. It'd be easier for them in the future to incorporate those jobs. Now, you might be saying, well, that doesn't really prove that they're doing that. Oh, but it does. It does, and here's why. If they killed off the replacement, they have to then modify the current. And modifying the current is cheaper than actually doing and fixing and finishing the replacement. So the kicker is, when they update the replacement, what do you think is going to be in there as new jobs? Well, it's very simple. They're going to be including jobs that basically are at-home data entry, at-home communication with others, at home management and direction, at home project management, at home whatever. When they start proposing and putting that in, that is when disability benefits are going to be almost entirely, in my opinion, a very specific 50 plus year old and over, unless you're in the severe to extreme category. And when I say severe to extreme, I mean people for like anxiety, depression, panic attacks, where they're in a mental facility for multiple nights every three to four months. That's what I mean by that. You know, none of this, you know, I'm, I have anxiousness, but I'm not on medication. Th those people were approved 15 years ago. They're not even disabled nowadays at the level, many of them, that is required nowadays. Okay. You know, those people that were like, oh, I've never been, you know, to a mental facility for, you know, overnight. You know, remember, some mental impairments require that, some don't. But when it comes to anxiety, PTSD, depression, panic attacks, mood disorders, bipolar, personality disorders, schizoaffective, schizophrenia, et cetera, when it comes to those types, they're looking for that level of heavy evidence. Not the whole like, well, I don't really have any mental medications and I go to a psychologist every six months and, you know, sometimes I check in and talk with a therapist, but they're not really a therapist. Those people don't get approved anymore. It just doesn't happen. Okay. All right. In the NPRM, um, we solicited feedback on whether we should revise our requirements so that individuals completing the work history forms do not need to report jobs held for a short period of time. Following the thoughtful feedback we received from commenters in support of a range of different time periods, we have decided that we will not consider PRW to include work and individuals started and stopped in fewer than 30 calendar days. We are revising this language in 20 CFR 404.1560B1. <clears throat> now, here's why they're doing that. Let me just let me just tell you why they're doing that. They're getting rid of the 30 calendar day jobs in your work history. So what they have inside their system called the Electronic Records Express is <clears throat> what's called the detailed earnings query. They press a button and the IRS sends it over. They send over four documents usually, but that's that's the one we use the most. 
So the detailed earnings query tells you who you worked for, how much you earned, basic location data, uh, and a little bit other stuff, right? And what it goes through, just so you understand it, is that it will tell us not the specific amount of time that you worked at a job. It, it won't tell us that. We, we don't have that information. But when you don't have much earnings, we know if this thing is under four grand, under five grand, stuff like that, we know to ask how long did you work at that job, right? Because if you were working there for multiple months, then you know, you're probably going to be past four or five grand. So we know as attorneys and judges and things like that to ask, hey, how long did you work there? But here's the thing. If you worked for a job for less than 30 days, and this is what the SSA is thinking, well, even if you had enough time to learn it, it was an SVP1 or SVP2 job, obviously you couldn't keep it. Because think about it. If you can't keep a job for 30 days or more, well, shit, all that is is either day labor crap, right? You're working day labor, or you tried to do it, it failed. Now, what's interesting about this whole day labor idea is that people go out, they do a job, they're done, send them to another place. And day labor is like, you know, for a lot of the guys out there, and I know I know somebody will get up, I, I, somebody will say something in the comments, and I'll just be like, dude, get your shit together. But bottom line is, the guys usually work the construction jobs, okay? And I understand somebody in the comments will be like, oh, no, no, uh, yeah, I got it, I got it. The women will usually work the jobs that are at the convention centers with cleanup. Those are your classic two main day labor jobs for those two groups, okay? You can spread them however you want, but that's how it works in the real world. Now, as a result of that, those jobs, they'll go clean up for this game, for that game, for this, you know, music artist, whatever, cool. They'll go do construction on this road job, on that job, on this tree job, whatever, and then it ends. And so what they're looking at is, do we incorporate this job? And so the thing is with day labor, what's interesting is that a lot of people jump from day labor to day labor. So they'll work for labor this, and then they'll work for labor that corporation. And then they'll work for employee bridge this, an employee you know tunnel that, right? And so what you're getting are people who are working all over the place with these different groups for under 30 days. Now, with that said, you do get some people who work for a labor group continuously and repetitively, repetitively for an extended time. And they're keeping those when they look at to see if you're disabled, because that says to them, you can wake up on time, you can get there, you can perform the tasks, you can get along with people, etc. And that's the logical basis for why they're going to keep those jobs past 30 days. All right, let's keep rolling. All right, uh, next thing here. Um, okay. I just want to skip through some of the stuff. Okay, they're removing the 30 days. It's got to be at least, you know, text for the minimum threshold, 30 calendar days. So it's really 30 calendar days and more, okay? Uh, and they will explain how we will consider work that started and stopped in fewer than 30 days. These changes are discussed below. Okay, so let's go through it real quick. Um, okay, we are adding into 20 CFR 404.1560 subsection B1I. Past relevant work is work that has been done within the past five years that was substantial gainful activity, right now that's 1550 bucks a month, and that lasted long enough for you to learn to do it. So remember, if you've got a job where you didn't even earn 1550 bucks, that job's cut off. We don't know. We don't care. We don't want to know. We're not spending time figuring out whether or not you were able to do that job. It's cut. We don't use it for the step four analysis, okay? We will not consider work to be past relevant work if you started and stopped it in fewer than 30 calendar days. We are making parallel revisions in 20 CFR 416.960B1I, which is it's a similar write-up, similar rule. Okay. All right. We are adding to 20 CFR 444.1560B1II uh, when we stated that we consider past relevant work and work experience, 30 calendar days means a period of 30 consecutive days, including weekends, starting from the first day of work. When we consider whether work lasted 30 calendar days, we generally do not consider the total number of hours or days worked during that period, or whether the work was full-time or part-time. The 30 calendar days requirement is separate from the consideration of substantial gainful activity or whether you worked long enough to learn how to do the work. Although the work performed during the 30 calendar days may count towards the time needed for you to learn to do the work. 
the 30 calendar days requirement also applies if you were self-employed or an independent contractor. And that's the trick right there. That's what they'll get people. Because people will be like, oh, I did this job. When, when were you not doing this job? I was always doing the job. I was the owner. I was the independent contractor. I was always doing it. That's how they're going to get a lot of those people who own their own company. Okay. All right. Next one. Uh, the 30 calendar day requirement also applies if you're a self-employed or independent contractor. We will consider whether you were engaged in the same type of work for 30 calendar days, even if an individual work assignments or contracts each lasted fewer than 30 calendar days. We're making parallel revisions into the other statute as well. They are revising 20 CFR 404.1565 from the prior text. So they're saying it was originally this. If you have no work experience or worked only off and on or for brief periods of time during the five-year period, we generally consider that these do not apply. To read in the final rule, this is what they're changing it to, if you have no work experience or, do you, or you did work and started and stopped in a period of fewer than 30 calendar days during the five-year period, we generally consider that these do not apply. We are making parallel revisions. Now, let me tell you something. They will add caveats as to what they think should be considered within that 30-day period. But in practical application, practical application, when the attorneys are sitting in front of the judges and we're doing adjudications for SSDI and SSI benefits, we are not going to waste time on 30-day calculations of past work because there's not enough time in a hearing. They either did a real job where they were working it for, you know, three, four, five, six months, or they didn't. They were either earning enough or they didn't. We're not going to waste time spending it on something where you work there for two weeks that they may fit within the caveat elements of this whole thing. Not happening. We're not blowing a bunch of time during a 45-minute hearing on something you barely touched. Okay. And again, this is this is the SSA writing in how they can perfect the model. But the model in, in practical application, there's not enough time for a hearing for us to blink around with under 30-day jobs. Okay, here we go. We are adding this minimum 30-day calendar threshold in response to feedback we solicited. To clarify our intent, here are some examples. Example one, on March 1st, 2023, an individual began working a job that requires only a brief demonstration to learn. So it's an SVP1, Specific Vocational Preparation 1. What are Specific Vocational Preparation 1 jobs? Well, SVPs go from 1 to 9. 9 takes 10 years to learn the job. 1 takes just a short demonstration. What's an SVP1? Here's the shovel. There's the hole. Here's a broom. There's the floor. Here's a mop. There's the tile. Those are SVP1 jobs. Okay. All right. So on March 1st, this person begins the job. The individual's last day of work was March 30th. So we got our 30 days there, right? The individual worked at the job for 30 calendar days because they started work on March 1st and their last day of work was on March 30th, 2023. In this situation, the job would qualify as past relevant work if it was performed at the SGA level, earning above $1,550 during that month and during the five-year relevant work period. Now, the SSA at the higher levels created this rule that will almost certainly not be followed because we do not have enough time to dick around with it during a hearing. If you worked it under 30 days, we don't have time to fluff around with that. It's just not going to happen. Now, you get other situations, right? I can, I can make this work. They're a real estate person. They worked for 30 days. They had a deal close. They got $10,000. That they'll take a look at. That the judge is going to be interested in. But this, where you're, you know, you're just earning whatever, let's say you earn $1,600, nobody's got time for that crap. Nobody has time for that. Example two, on February 1st, 2023, an individual began working at a job that requires only a brief demonstration to learn. Again, another SVP1 job. The individual's last day of work was February 28th, 2023, so only 28 days. Although the individual held the job long enough to learn to do it, the work started and stopped in fewer than 30 calendar days. In this situation, the job would not qualify as past relevant work, even if it was performed at the SGA level and during the five-year relevant period. You see like the flip there, less than 30 days, more than 30 days earned over SGA. Here's the reality. If you did a job that was like, you know, SVP1, then you're earning anywhere's, you know, between minimum wage and a couple bucks above it. Now, if you live in California, minimum wage is higher, 
right? Minimum wage is, is higher. There, there's no doubt about it. But I want you to understand something. I think it's I think it's really important with this situation. And I want you to just keep this in mind. With this situation, where it really matters is that the DDS reps and the ALJs adjudicating the claim are right now completely massively overloaded. Their stock of how many claimants they can process in a certain period is always at 100% full for the most part right now because they have a massive backlog. They are not going to screw around with this BS. They're just going to go ahead and say, cool, I'm considering this job, this job, and this job is PRW for past relevant work. I am not considering any of those. That's how they'll play it out. All right. Severability. Let's go through this part because this part's important too. In the event, an, in, in a, an invalidation of any part of this rule or intent is to preserve the remaining portions, yada, yada, then they will keep the rest of the rule. So we've now gone through all this stuff. Let's go through the justification for the changes. And then we're going to go to the next video, which are some scary math details uh, that I pulled up. I know some people are saying, oh, why do you always have negative news? I don't always have negative news. I help people and I answer their questions all the time live. That boosts them and bolsters them and gives them direction in life. But the SSA is going through a massive audit, just like the VA is. So the VA, the veterans with their 100% PNT or TDIU, a lot of them are getting kicked off of that and put down to 90% because the government doesn't want to pay. Same thing for disability benefits, but disability benefits aren't a percentage of approval. It is a you are either fully disabled or not on the civilian side. Well, guess what's happening to a lot of those? A lot of them are getting kicked off, and that's what we're going to go through in the next video. All right, here we go. Justification for the changes. We have long recognized that the gradual change occurs in most jobs in the national economy so that after a certain period of time, it is not realistic to expect that skills and abilities an individual acquired while performing these jobs continue to apply. Now, some of you are thinking, well, shit, if I sit at a computer, I can do this job and, repeat, and repeatedly do this job and it's no biggie. But remember, not all jobs are sit at a computer, type in stuff jobs. A lot of them, you're sitting at a lathe. A lot of them, you're sitting at very heavy machinery, right? A front loader, something that's going to do massive drilling, et cetera. And the skills that you pick up to do that job, when you haven't done it for 15 years, those skills aren't there anymore. It's not like, you know, jumping on the bicycle again. All right. In this rule, we are changing the relevant work period to five years because it reflects the shorter collection cycles of occupational surveys and data programs, which establish a frame of reference for understanding changes in occupational requirements. Now, what's interesting is they their main paragraph one justification reasoning is a shit reasoning. Their reasoning is it's because of the vocational experts and their shorter collection cycles of the occupational surveys and the data programs that they're like, eh, we'll use this. That's not why they're really doing this. It's not because the statistical data pulled by the vocational expert just it only makes sense because they study something for that long. No, they're doing this because it takes too much time to F around with the hearing for the past 15 years of work. They want to shorten hearing time so that the judges can get hearings done consistently within a 45-minute period. That's why they're doing this. They're not doing this because, well, there's, there's stuff and there's articles and statistics and it was only able to study five years of that job, and blah, blah, blah. They don't, that's not why they're doing it. They're doing it because they want to shorten hearings. That's why. Changing the relevant work period from the prior 15 years to five years and setting a minimum time period of 30 calendar days for performing work will better account for the diminishing relevance of work skills over time and reduce the burden of individuals applying for disability. This change will allow us to improve the quality of the information we receive by eliminating the individual's need to recall and consistently report detailed information about less recent work or work performed for less than 30 calendar days, reduce the time spent filling up uh, work history forms, and reduce wait times. Here it is. Here it is. It's, it's the second paragraph, last or second to last sentence. This is the real reason, okay? But it's not, it's not a, a fluffy, nice-feeling reason, okay? And reduce wait times for, for a determination or a decision. Accordingly, this change will improve customer service and adjudicative efficiency adjudicative efficiency, last sentence, second paragraph, the real reason they're doing this. This speeds up 
how much work they have to put into your claim because they get to do less work and get it done faster. That's why this is happening. The whole occupational surveys and data programs of collection site, nobody gives a shit about that. That's not why. No, that's not why this is happening. It is because they get to speed up their adjudicative efficiency, their ability to figure out whether or not you're disabled. Boom. It's 10 minutes faster. It's 30 minutes faster. Okay. The final rule will achieve several goals. First, this final rule will allow individuals to focus on the most current relevant information about their past work. Sure. Okay, fine. That's true. We largely rely on individuals self-reporting for information about their work. That's true. We put down on the 3369 form what we did. Sometimes we fill out the 820 or 821, whatever, which, well, no, those are the two, employed and then self-employed, uh, that basically talk about specific earnings, how much you lifted, did you manage people, were you a lead worker, what did you do during the day, all that jazz. We largely rely on them in our adjudicative experience. Information tends to be less accurate and less complete for jobs that individuals held in the distant past. Yeah, because nobody remembers what the hell they were doing. Unless it was career job. If it was career job, everything links up. You're part of that job. You used to do this. Then you got this title, this title, this title. Now you're doing that. But if it was like, hey, I worked at Steve's Burgers about 14 years ago. What'd you do? Ah, I have burgers. I did burgers. I laid them on the grill and I did them. That's that's what it is. Okay, we expect this final rule will result in our receive in our receiving more complete work history forms and reduce the need for our staff to follow up for additional work history information. Now, they're not going to be more complete. Okay, they're just going to be basically. Well, okay, so that's that's a cute that's a trick thing right there. That's a good that's a trick statement. Will they be more complete? No, because it's only five years and not the past fifteen years. But will those past five year jobs have the same amount of information that they would have put down anyways? Yes. So if you take the percentage of jobs that they didn't put as much down on and, and weren't as correct on from 15 years ago and get rid of those, it increases the percentage of those jobs that you did within the past five years having accurate information. So yeah, that's a true sentence, but that's that's a tricky bullshitty sentence. That's that. Let me read it to you again so you can hear it. We expect this final rule will result in our receiving more complex work history forms and reduce the need for our staff to follow up for additional work history information. They won't have as much. They won't be as detailed. There won't be as much of a history timeline. Will they be more complete only for the jobs within the past five years? No, they'll just be more. They'll just be you know what you would have gotten anyways for those past five years. But as a percentage, that means it's more accurate because we know what we did in the past five years more than the past 15 years. Second, this final rule will better account for current evidence on the diminishing relevance of work skills and changes in job requirements over time. That is true. That is accurate. That is good. Third, this final rule will reduce processing time and improve customer service. I love how they put that last. That's number one on this thing. They give a shit about speed of adjudication. When you're handling millions of claims, they care about speed in processing adjudications. Let me read it to you again. They put it as the last one. It is the it is obviously the thing they're worried about. Third, this final rule will reduce processing time and improve customer service. That's what they're worried about. That's what they're achieving here. As we discussed in the NPRM, each year we adjudicate millions of claims for disability benefits and our ability to make determinations and decisions more quickly will ultimately benefit the public we serve. That is true. You know, it's funny because out of those three that they made like bullet points on, the third one, which they put last, which I say is the reason, then they give a backup sentence right after that, but not for the first two bullet points, only the last one, because that's the one they give a damn about. Fourth, the, this final rule will lessen the information collection burden on individuals by reducing, on average, the number of jobs about which they must provide us with information. Cool. Okay. In summary, by eliminating an individual's need to recall and report detailed information about less recent work, we anticipate this final rule will allow us to improve the quality of the information we receive, will significantly reduce burden on the individuals from filling out work history forms, and will reduce case processing and wait times. All right, let me explain what's actually happening here inside the SSA and why it's important for you. When they go ahead and have a detailed earnings query from the IRS, right, and you put down on your 3369 work history form some jobs, 
but you miss certain jobs or you get the times wrong for certain jobs, then the DDS rep has to reach out, ask you to correct them. And sometimes they have to mail you a pre-filled out 3369 with what's actually in it. So the point is they want to cut all that shit out. They don't want the DDS rep to have to spend the time to go and fix the claimant's screw-ups with what the work history actually was. Okay. These customers, these uh, no, these outcomes will overall offer a better customer experience for individuals applying for disability and will increase our adjudicative efficiency. For more detailed explanation of how we expect this final rule to achieve these objectives, please refer to the justification for change section in the NPRM. Bottom line is, you get it. You got it. It is what it is. You got it at this point. All right. So now you know. But summary for me, here's what they're doing. They're getting rid of the 15-year rule and making it five years. So they're looking back five years as to the work you did from the date that you're claiming you became disabled, which is either your protective filing date when you filed or your amended alleged onset date, which could potentially go back 17 months or more from the date in which you filed for SSDI benefits only, not SSI. SSI can only go back to your protective filing date. With that said, they also have provisions in here for CDR people, people who are on disability benefits who are then going through a review for disability benefits. Now, the thing I hear at least five times a week are people calling in and saying to me, I don't understand how they could put me through a CDR every single year. This doesn't make sense. Why is this happening to me? Right? I hear that many, many times all week. You have to understand that while you see yourself as this severely broken and disabled individual, there is a warrior out there who fought for America that is missing their hands. That's the person they're not checking every year. The person who has anxiety, who doesn't always go to the doctor and misses a lot of appointments, that person's going to get check-ins. The person who had surgery and their back is supposed to be getting better with therapy in addition to it, that they're going to check in every year. The person with fibromyalgia, I'm just going to stop there. That's all you need to know. They have fibromyalgia, that they're going to check each year. Okay. The person who is an amputee, the person who has had three failed back surgeries, the person who basically is spending most of their time inside a homeless help program as a result of their mental instability, where they constantly have to put them into, you know, behavioral centers, uh, sanatoriums, asylums. They're not checking in on that person every year. So you got to understand where you're on in the spectrum of how disabled you are. You know, and remember, too, there was a time where disabled people would just say, I'm super, I'm super severely impaired. I'm super disabled. And, you know, I used to listen to these people on the phone, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I used to listen to them on the phone. Tell me about how bad they actually were. Let me explain something. Okay. When you got to tell me how bad you are, and then I ask you two or three questions afterwards, and it clearly obviously shows that you're not as bad as other people who have those impairments. You have to understand that the process of disability benefits is a swinging pendulum. And over here are your options for those who are severely disabled enough. Okay. And what's happening is that little section here for you are severe enough is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're getting closer to the requirements of you don't have to be severe, but you have to be extremely impaired. Remember mild, moderate, severe, extreme. We're now doing this severe to extreme, the claimants that get approved are approaching more and more of those who are extremely disabled, okay? That's what's happening with the program. Now, remember, this whole thing right here does not affect listing level criteria people, those who meet equal or exceed a disability listing, where you are as bad as worse than or equivalent to a predefined disability on their big list. It doesn't affect compassion allowance listing uh, disabled people, the people that usually are going to die in six to 12 months, or basically they're bed bound for the most part of their life. Okay. Or they're stuck in an insane asylum for most of their time, right? It doesn't affect those people. They're going to get through without having to make it to element four and five, element four and five, this whole rule only changes the thing that most people are found disabled through, which is the weakest form of approval for disability benefits, which is the vocational allowance. So if you're ever wondering, like, what kind of approval did I get? You want to go get your hearing brief and read it and see if you got a vocational allowance where they said this person can't work. That is the weakest form of approval. Okay, so and just to clarify, let me just simplify this for you. 
If you're sitting there and saying, I'm really, really bad, but you got a vocational allowance, that means you're not really, really bad. You're on the least bad that would allow you to get benefits. The people that are on the compassion allowance listings, they're really, really bad. And here's how it works. Vocational allowance people, okay? Grid out people, okay? We're getting more severe. Listing level criteria people, okay? Compassionate allowance listing people, okay? If you're going around, you know, having fun and going on vacations, if you're, you know, basically able to drive your car long distances, the RVers, that stuff, you're not, you're not up here in the compassion allowance listing people. You're not down here in the listing level people. You're not. You might have been at some point. You could have been. But if you're doing that stuff, where you know, then then you're not. If you're going to islands on vacations with cruises, you're not in that category. You're probably in the vocational allowance and the grid out options. You got to be careful because that group right there is what's getting heavily audited by the SSA. We're going to actually go through the financial figures right here. All right. So what you need to know is this, this rule, which is probably the largest social security disability and supplemental security income rule change for 2023, 2024, probably what we're going to get in 2025, that is good for disability beneficiaries, people who are approved for disability benefits, people who are looking to get approved for disability benefits, only affects those who are in the vocational allowance category, where they go to element four, can you do your past work? And element five, can you do other types of jobs in the national economy? You will see fewer denials in element four, and that might affect and probably will slightly element five. Can you do any other jobs in the national economy that are skilled, semi-skilled, or unskilled? That's element five. Okay, we call it relevant transferable skilled work. Can you do it? But bottom line, it comes down to can you do either skilled, semi-skilled, or unskilled work? in any job in the DOT, in the national economy. That's how that rule works. All right, guys, uh, please remember to like and subscribe. Head to Google, type in Disability Resolution PA. Uh, that is the law firm that I work for. Uh, bottom line is throw some stars up there for me. I always love waking up to those. Please remember during the law firm hours, nine to five during the week, do not call the law firm with, I just have a quick question. Don't. If you need representation, cool. Give us a call. We'll work on your claim. We'll get you rolling in the right direction. But if you just have a quick question, we are not responding to those going forward because my staff is ready to exterminate me. They are literally ready to, because of this whole YouTube channel. So with that said, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I go live. I answer all those quick questions. You get five to seven minutes. Use a fake name, no story mode, have your legal question ready. Those are the rules. You dial the 407-279-1754 number. That's the gig. If you need more than five to seven minutes, you can hire me for an hour. You get a literal hearing spot on the hearing calendar, okay? Now, I will catch you guys in the next video. The next video is specifically the math that scares the shit out of me as to what's happening with this industry. I will see you at that shortly. Please take care of yourself, and I will see you soon. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.